<laughs> I told Nancy, I got to talk to you about Kyla. She's like, please don't tell me she's quitting. Quitting? Jeez. She's Why not. Why did she think that? Because I, I said I need to talk to her about Kyla. Oh. <laughs> but I'd like Kyla to take a community engagement course through Ryerson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, course. I remember you were talking about that. Yeah. And then I want, Great. I want her yeah. to be able to at least have an hour or so uh, work time to do that. Of course. Yeah, yeah. She's a busy if mom. You, if you get a hard time, just tell parents. me. And okay. Just tell me if you get a hard time because that's that's like, we'll just go right to uh, Steve, get it sorted out. Yeah, because she, she needs um, our help because we're trying to grow her capacity, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I want to try and do this for her because we talked about it and she's like, Jen, you know, I have my kids and their extracurricular activities. Where am I going to get this time to study? Yeah, no, that, that, that's no problem. That's no big deal. So I'll talk to your manager and see if we can get you some study time during the day. Yeah, that's no big deal. Okay, guys, we're uh, two minutes uh, out from the show. I'm going to mute things here in the studio, so good luck and have a good show. Okay, right. sounds good. We always have a good time. I have a question for you, Don. Sure. Regarding the caribou study. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. ask during our presentation as well. However, okay. how can communities get that data? So are we able to present that data? Because I remember Ange did that in one community, and we can actually see live updates of the, uh, the well thing. yeah that that I don't that I don't know I, I mean that's okay. uh, probably a probably part of a data sharing agreement right remember out so of yeah it, if we have a data sharing agreement with a particular community we can present yeah those findings in community okay yeah because it's subject to that agreement right that the province mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. made with us so it's it it would be extending that agreement to the communities as well okay so i think that's something we can we can chat about when we get to some of the yeah. findings or yeah okay yeah that's what i would say But you know, there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of data available available publicly, right? As part of the the EA in terms of identifying, um, you know, what's happened, right? Where they've been moving and and things like that. That's it, there's a lot mm -hmm. of information that's going to be available in the EA document, right, or the IA document. Okay, we can talk about that too. Okay. everyone my name is Don Parkinson and I'm a consultation specialist with Atkins Realis today we are continuing our series of live stream topics as our project moves through consultation round two of the environmental assessment phase the topics we are covering parallel our project activities or are of uh, community importance so we hope these will help our viewers and listeners uh, better understand the project and provide input along the way. And uh, as usual, with me today is my uh, co-host, Jennifer Ashwazake Pereira, my colleague and an Indigenous Engagement and Traditional Knowledge Specialist at uh, Atkins Realis. Jennifer is also a member of Henvey Inlet First Nation, which is located on the French River, south of Sudbury, and works with me on our projects across Canada. Hi, Jen. Happy uh, Monday uh, noontime. <laughs> Happy Monday. I can't say good morning anymore. <laughs> no, you can't. I was ready to say that, and then I realized I couldn't. So uh, the nightmare of the morning is over. Let's hope the afternoon That's is right. better. Now, right? we're, now we're getting into our week. 
Andy. We are getting into our week. So, uh, so today's topic, Jen, as you know, is the preliminary results of the um, WSR caribou studies that were conducted as part of the environmental and impact assessments. And um, this is an important topic, and we thought it was a topic that community uh, members would enjoy listening to. It, it's, uh, you know, it's the result of a lot of our uh, baseline uh, studies that have been undertaken over the last uh, five, almost, yeah, five years, I guess. Oh, wow. um, so a long, yeah, a long period of time we started with a winter uh, caribou survey in 2019. And uh, so let's let's just dive in. And as we normally do, we'll just do a little rundown on what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with um, the project background um, to get everybody up to the sort of same level uh, in terms of knowledge about the project. We're going to talk about the types of studies, um, caribou studies that have been undertaken. Um, we're going to go over the uh, caribou winter aerial surveys from 2018, 2019, and 2021 in terms of looking at the results. Um, we're going to talk about um, caribou collaring, like why that is done and how it's done. And then we're going to move into the results of the caribou collaring, um, looking at um, uh, during the calving season and during overwintering. And, and then finally, we're going to talk about future analysis that there's, as there's still more work to be done before the uh, environmental assessment or the impact assessment is completed. And then finally, we're going to talk about how you can get in touch with us. So let's talk about the project location. The project is located um, uh, in northwestern Ontario. Webaquay settlement itself is about 200 to 250 kilometers from both Hudson Bay and James Bay. And uh, the road uh, is a planned 107 kilometer long road running from the airport in Webaquay First Nation, uh, southeast to um, just east of the Mukatai River uh, near the McFalds, in the McFalds Lake area. In terms of the purpose of the Webaquay Supply Road, three main purposes. The first is to move material supplies and people from the airport to the McFalls Lake area. The second is to provide employment and, and economic development opportunities to community members, but also at the same time allowing them to remain in their community and preserve and enhance their, their language and culture. And then finally, to provide um, uh, work experience and training opportunities for, for youth uh, and, you know, generally to help encourage um, them to pursue additional skills um, through post-secondary uh, education and, and training programs. Uh, in terms of the, the project itself, uh, again, it's a, a planned 107-kilometer uh two-lane uh, gravel road um, extending from the airport to the McFalls Lake area. Of those 107 kilometers, 17 um, sit within the, uh, the First Nations reserve lands. Uh, the actual planning corridor that's used for the purposes of the environmental and impact assessment is two kilometers wide. So picture a two kilometer wide band extending from Webaquay Airport uh, southeast to the McFalls Lake area. So within that, that band uh, would sit the road. And uh, so that's, that's called our, um, our, uh, the, the corridor, mm -hmm. the, the planning corridor, the corridor that we're going to be working with. Um, uh, and it was, it was, uh, it emerged from a, from a group of alternatives. And, uh, and then finally, the, the width uh, of the clear, the cleared uh, width for the corridor is 35 meters. And then continuing with the description, there would be three major uh, water crossings. The first being of Winisk Lake uh, running east uh, from Webaquay, um, and then the second would be southeast of Webaquay across the Winniscasis Channel. 
And then fin the final major crossing is the Mukatai River at the at almost at the end of the uh, Webakwe supply road. So that's in that's southeast of quite a bit southeast of Webakwe. Um, uh, a road is more than just a road. Um, so it includes temporary, both temporary and permanent aggregate pit or rock quarry areas. Um, these areas, you know, require access roads to get to them. And then uh, there might be water crossings along the way uh, for the road to cross over. So there might be um, culverts or, or, or bridges, other types of water crossing structures required. Um, there would also be temporary facilities such as construction camps that would serve uh, to accommodate construction crews um, and there would be operations and maintenance offices uh, built those would be permanent facilities uh, at different locations along along the road um, going back to the construction camps they would have um, uh, supportive infrastructure such as a wastewater treatment plant like a small wastewater treatment plant and then a uh, a drinking water storage area as well too and then there would be storage and lay down yards typically associated with the camps and those are would be temporary for for storing um, uh, construction materials and equipment as well so so that's basically the description of the project and uh, now Jen we're ready to um, hop into uh, talking about the different types of studies that have been undertaken um, for caribou on this project, there's been a lot of effort spent um, doing uh, yeah. doing caribou base uh, baseline work. Um, two different two main types of studies have been undertaken. The first is these winter aerial surveys, which are not small uh, surveys. They're done typically in February. Um, there's certain conditions that they have to be conducted under. So they were done in 2018, 2019, and 2021. And they typically involve um, uh, like a, a crew of, of people, um, um, and including, I think, typically three biologists who are basically looking out the window, making observations. And so, you know, this work is, um, it involves coming up with a flight plan, so if you can imagine the road, the path of the road, the planned road, and then you, what you're doing is you're doing these, you're running these things called transects and they're lines that are at 90 degrees to the road. And um, depending on the, on, the, on the study that's undertaken, these, these lines are very long. So they're perpendicular or at 90 degrees to the road and uh, just to give you an example, in, in 2018, there were 59 of these transects, so these perpendicular lines. So, and the idea is the transects is doing these transects and flying these transects, you're taking sort of a snapshot in time in February, in winter, when you can see the tracks because there's so much snow on the ground. And that gives you an opportunity to sort of say okay what's going on right now when it comes to caribou where are they what are they you know what are they doing and um so not only caribou are observed but anything else so there's other like any other animals that happen to be uh, observed whether it's a uh, wolverine that's right uh, moose um all those kinds of observations wolves. observations are made yeah. yes yeah wolves yeah we have we have we've seen lots of wolves and and then they record the location of them too. So um, these are really useful, uh, even though they're snapshots. I mean, they're done typically over a week, I think. Um, these ones were done typically in a week. Um, even though they're snapshots, they're, they're pretty useful pieces of information, especially when you do, um, like we've done, three years of them. So, you know, just to give you an example, in 2018, um, the team surveyed, 2,666 linear kilometers. Wow. So that covered a study area of 5,800 square kilometers. That's a big area. So, um, and then 2019, we did 39 transects 
each of 47 kilometers. And uh, so you and we flew a total of 1776 kilometers. So, you know, this is a big area that was that was being covered by these surveys. And there were a lot of really interesting observations made um, as well. We also did the collaring studies, which which are really, really interesting on their own. And these these allow you it just takes you a step further. So it allows you to, to sort of follow the caribou for a three year period. And um, in real time, right? Because in real time. That's right. So because you've got this collar on them, GPS collar, you're getting you know where they are. And so you can see what they're doing at different times a year. And it's just really, really helpful way of, um, of tracking the animals and, and understanding the areas that they use. And the data that comes from it is very helpful for, for planning purposes. Um, right. So let's move habitats, down. Or the habits, rather. Yes, uh, absolutely. That's right. And... Um, you know, because you can you can speculate on what those you know where their you know where their calving areas might be, but you you know you really don't know until you see the data, right, and see where they are in the right. areas that they're using. Um, right. There's places we well, think we know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like in theory, you could say that you know the calving areas might be these you know um, isolated peninsulas that are protected a little bit more protected from predators, right? Um, you can think that, but um, you may not, you know, that the data may not show that. So um, it's really helpful to have the, this collaring data. Um, so those are the two types of studies that have been undertaken. Again, a lot of time, a lot of resources have been spent on caribou, trying to understand more about them. Um, but why don't we dig into the aerial surveys next and talk a little bit okay. about the aerial surveys starting in 2018 and um, 2018 that was our first year of doing this uh, they saw 45 caribou um, at seven different locations sure oh it says winter aerial surveys but were there any callers put on in 2018 or no 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 no, okay. no, no, that's a separate exercise, right? So that was, I can't remember the year the callers were put on. I think um, the that was the, 20, the year of the callers. I think that was 2019. 2022, was it? 2019. Okay. Well, it's, they've been on for three years. Anyway, yeah, they were, they were put on after, after a couple of winter surveys had been done. Um, okay. So in 2018, um, you know, there were 45 seen, but the group size, the biggest group of caribou was 13 individuals. Um, they were only seen east and southeast of Webaquay and and not west of Webaquay. And so the question might be, well, why is that? Well, east and southeast, you have what you call mature upland black spruce forests with lakes. And that's really good habitat for caribou. Um, there's a lot of cover. west of Webaquay, yeah, lots of cover. But west of Webaquay, they had a forest fire 40 years ago, so that area is still regenerating. So it's not ideal caribou habitat yet. It will be once it becomes more mature, but right now it isn't. So it's not, it's not being, it's not really supporting caribou uh, on the west side right now. So that's that's the 2018 results now when we moved to 2019 yeah yeah in 2019 it was a bit of a lean year for caribou when we did the survey um uh we did we saw 13 caribou in total and these were at four locations and the maximum size was uh, of group size was six so it was different, right? It was different. They weren't they weren't in the study area, um, and again, they, when the ones that were observed were east and southeast of Webaquay. Uh, you know, again with that mature habitat that they prefer, and right. again there were none seen west of Webaquay, right? And um, so most of the caribou activity, as it says on the slide, um, 
was a longa band extending approximately 5 to 30 kilometers east from Webequay. So that was what was seen. Now we'll move to the winter surveys of 2021, which is the slide on the screen right now. Um, this was an interesting year. There was a marked increase in caribou presence compared to 2018 and 2019. There were 552 animals recorded. Wow. Um, within the, yeah, it was a lot. Within the, um, the study area, the caribou uh, uh, study area. And uh, they were distributed very widely. Um, like it was a, a, like a huge difference from previous years, unbelievable difference from previous years. And I don't know if we totally understand yet why, but um, that was, that was what happened. So that 2021 survey was pretty eye opening. Um, yeah. Uh, and but considering now, they have a very large, large area um, to yeah. look at what was going on in the land and in um, the areas where they, um migrate but you know it's amazing like when you when you when you look at some of the maps that indicate you know the movements of of these mm -hmm. animals particularly because there's two populations right now i guess i should right. should have talked a bit about yeah. this before there's two migrant there's two populations in the in the area there's the boreal and then there's the eastern migratory and the boreal population is is across northern ontario all the way from Quebec to the Manitoba border. Um, the Eastern migratory population, uh, they actually use the tundra. So, and the forest tundra areas. So further north of where Webequay is, right? Um, where mm -hmm. there's, you know, less, less vegetation. Oh, I think we froze. I think we lost on there. Okay. I'm seeing you. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. Oh. The internet's going out. Did you take over from where he was, Jim? I think so. So we were talking about um, the different herds, and we left off at the Eastern Migratory Caribou Herd. So they they are um, utilizing. Um, the more northern regions or the tundra areas of of the land. So we wanted to track um, the caribou movement across um, for all the seasons for three years so we could look at um, the habitat areas, uh, know where the calving areas are, and how they utilize the different areas and their movement in accordance with the um, the corridor for Webequay Supply Road. So moving into um, how we were collaring the caribou. So, so far, um, 29 healthy adult female caribou were captured and collars were put on the caribou. So that was done by using a net gun from a helicopter. And so the um, collars were deployed or they fell off in mid to late February. So that would have been um, last month. Um, so we, to avoid disturbance um, during, oh, deployed. <laughs> they, the nets were put down and the, the collars were put on in mid to late February so that um, nobody was collaring um, pregnant um, cows. So later on in the season. So then each caribou um, had samples taken. So there had a sample of blood taken to look at that and look at health, um, their pellets, as well as fur samples to look at the pregnancy status and uh, um, see if there were any kind of parasites or look at the um, genetic analysis for the caribou herds um as well as looking at cortisol levels or stress levels in in the caribou and then they also looked at the teeth for the estimated age of the caribou and i hear that dawn is back 
I am back. Yes, sorry about that. That's my, uh, I guess my no internet problem. connection. I'm switching. So we were from, looking at from one to the other. Yeah, uh, telecom providers uh, in the next few days, and obviously for good reason. Oh. So, um, yes. yeah, caribou, so caribou we're, collaring. We're... Caribou collaring is is interesting, um, just like you were saying, Jen. So you know we're targeting females with the caribou collaring, and and uh, the idea is is with the females because the females are you know we want to understand where they go, you know when they have their calves, right, and where they nurse those calves, right. That's really important to understand that. Um, and it, you know, it's still not completely understood the behavior, but, um, it's, it's a pretty good exercise, uh, and being able to track animals in real time is really interesting and it, 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 yeah. it yields a lot of information. So, and, and that's, like that's that, what I like that you pointed out that their behavior is not, um, very well understood considering we had less than, you know, we had 25, we saw 25 one year, yep. just over 50 another year. And then all of a sudden, was it last year, there was about 551 caribou spotted. So that's a huge leap. Yeah. I mean, and these we are, don't know why. yeah, we don't know. We don't know why, right? Like see, there are certain patterns, I think that the wildlife biologists have picked up, but you know, it's not absolute, right? I mean, weather plays a factor in so much of this so much but land use um, in other areas yeah absolutely absolutely and uh, but the i guess one point i should one thing i should point out is the reason why they target 30 is because they they expect a certain amount of um, mortality right of death to occur mm -hmm. within a population like that and as long as they've got like if they've got 20 to work with then those data are what you call statistically significant, which allows them so they can they can draw conclusions, you know, from from data sets of, of 20. Um, so that's that's sort of why they target so many. Um, it's not easy to do the capturing. Uh, you know, it's not perfect. Obviously, capturing isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not it, it is stressful for the animals. Um, but again, it comes down to a decision where you, if you want to understand the animals and, and what they do, um, and cause less harm to their populations, ultimately, then you really need to, you do these kinds of studies where you can track them, right? You can follow them and see what they're doing. So, um, That's it. I'm, I'm looking forward to the, um, next part, the findings. I know we don't have those at the moment, but there were blood samples taken, hair samples. Yeah. Um, Looking at the teeth for age so it'd be interesting to look at all of those things as well i can't wait to find that out yeah no that's you're right jen like i don't think that's come out yet like the some of the stuff that i've seen the preliminary data mm, like we're health. looking at doesn't include any of that yeah health and things like that and and just you know like stress levels right those cortisol levels are, are they're indicators of long-term stress um and so, you, you know, you, maybe you can get a sense for how stressed these animals are or, you know, from, you know, look, just because, you know, certain types of, you know, certain seasons, maybe the weather makes it harder to find food for them. So their stress levels might go up and, and, and then other seasons might be easier, right? So it'd be interesting to sort of mm -hmm. look at that. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the results of caribou collaring? Because that's, that's kind of interesting. Sure. Um, you know, there. The next slide I'm going to put up. Um, it it's it sort of takes all that data, location data, and puts it together, and uh, which is pretty amazing. So you think of all the observations that have been that are made over that uh, period of time. So what what we're looking at on the screen now is activity areas for collared female caribou during the calving seasons of 2021 and 2022. And what you see here is the Eastern migratory um, population, which are in blue, they head to the coast for calving, okay. right? Meanwhile, the boreal caribou, and we only had one car of boreal, well, there were two in the, in the population that was actually captured and collared, but um, that one boreal caribou, uh, I guess that survived, um, 
it doesn't go it doesn't go to the coast right so you can see the difference in behavior um and uh it's just you it's Does very it clear sorry Jen, when we're ahead. looking at this the second image don you know you see the green for the boreal caribou yep. then you see the blue for the eastern migratory and do their um paths for lack of a better word overlap in oh yeah scary? absolutely the green one's like a like a crescent shaped or an arc and then the the blue one's a little bit a little they bit do random, and they in, they interact they mate gen okay like the ones the eastern migratory caribou come down right during during the rest of the year they come down into the forest and and mate with the boreal caribou but okay. but then they go back out to the coast right um between may and and mid-july during the calving season so they okay. the females go to have their calves on the coast or in the coastal areas and then the males stay in the in the forest when that happens it's pretty interesting like what's going on uh, and uh, you know again we're going to get more data on this we're going to get a lot more figures mm -hmm. this is just some of the preliminary stuff but this next slide which is the overwintering which and that's kind of interesting too because when they when they winter so when you're talking December to March, right? When they when they're wintering, not when they're they're calving, um, they can move around all over the place. But the one place they're not is on the coast during the winter. Cold. So they probably are able to get more food, right? Yeah, it's too cold, right? Cold and windy. So they're probably over there. Able, yeah, cold and windy. Windy. You're better off going into the forest, right? You're protected from the wind. Probably more food available. So, you know, you can see from these three figures um, what's happened, right? See how far away from the mm -hmm. coast both the eastern migratory and the boreal caribou populations are. So there's a real market difference between uh, winter and the rest in, you know, spring and summer and fall for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, And so, you know, they're not, as you can tell from these three figures, you know they're not um, they're not always in the same area in uh, during the winter, right? They're not. They're not. You can tell from these figures. Uh, so that's you know kind of is consistent with with the winter um, aerial surveys, right, Jen? Like where remember we had yes. such small numbers, relatively small numbers, the first couple of years of the survey, and then 2021 we had like 552 in this in the local study area yeah it was it was crazy so the conditions must have been right for some reason something led them to that area just because there's more food available or 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 whatever but um but yeah yeah this this just sort of hopefully this just gives everybody a little bit of a preview as to to what to expect in the uh, environmental assessment there's there's going to be more data coming out and and it's very interesting i think we'll we'll try and share more with you you know as we as as it becomes available but um that's that's what we found and and uh moving on to the next slide you know there's you know when you get data like this uh you can also do what you call predictive modeling where you can identify areas where you think they there should be they should be more likely to be found um so that kind of modeling occurs um once you start getting the data on you know the observational data on where the where the caribou were at different points in time so oh I, this is I sort of the big sure go ahead i'm going to, i'm interrupting you no, so no, there's just one more thing that we we didn't talk about i don't believe we did is that the um, collars are programmed to fall off and i mistakenly said sure. that was deployment that happened last month and so they're supposed to fall off do we know when i don't know when yeah i, I yeah that's right they were there well i thought i thought they were coming off in march right for uh, like the nrl month? callers yeah okay yeah they're coming off so yeah they're 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 set for three years and then there's like a, a very small harmless explosive that, that sort of goes off and then the collar just falls off and the idea is is that you know um it it prevents it saves 
us having to stress the animals again by capturing mm -hmm. them, by recapturing them. So that way we just go and look for the collar. And so the collar is still emitting a signal right as to where it is. So we'll send okay. out a team and go and look for that collar and find the collar once the snow's gone. Um, so that's typically how that works. So I know for the Northern Road Link project, um, you know, they're a little bit further behind, but I think they're, the collars are coming off those animals. And again, that work's being done further further south, but mm -hmm. all the data's in on on the ones that were done for uh, Webquay Supply Road project. So, but there's lots more work to be done. Um, that report's being prepared now. Um, so there's more data crunching that's going on, um, but we certainly have a lot of information on caribou, which is important, right? We want to protect them and we want to make sure that we put this road and and build this road in a way that minimizes any impacts on them so that's why we mm -hmm. do the baseline work right is to to find out what's going on and and take that and get a good picture where they of go. what's uh, yeah what where they go and 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 how everything behaves and and the condition of everything, whether it's water or populations and fish populations, whatever, you need to have that baseline, that understanding in order to have something to compare to. So, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's, uh, those are the preliminary caribou results, Jen, and that wraps up today's discussion. Um, we hope this was helpful. We hope it encourages you to come back and, and see us again next week, um, back at the same time. Um, and then next week we're going to talk questions. about Yeah, ask us questions. Feel free to ask us questions. Send your comments. Uh, yes. And um, next week we're going to talk about the floating road, which means basically how we build the road through the muskeg. Um, so it's a great topic. Uh, so don't forget to keep in touch with our project team members via the contact information available uh, on our website, supplyroad.ca. There's lots of information there. And uh, we've been compiling information for four, the last four or five years. Um, so don't please don't uh, hesitate to go to our website. And if you have questions, absolutely get in contact with our team and we'll be happy to respond and have a discussion with you. So with that, Miigwech, and we will talk to you again next week. Right, Jen? Right. Chi Miigwech. That's right.